Hi, I'm John Blunt. I serve as the Associate Pastor at First Baptist Church of Jacksonville at the Nocatee Campus. Thank you so much for watching our sermon today. Our mission at First Baptist is to reach all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life. If you'd like to join us for church in person, we're located just south of Jacksonville in the Nocatee community. We hope you participate with us however you're watching today's service as we worship Jesus, pray, and read His Word together. If you have questions about today's message or just want to connect with us, you can find out more about our church at fbcjacks.com slash Nocatee or on Facebook at First Baptist Church Jacksonville Nocatee Campus. Thanks for joining us. All right, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you right now asking you for grace. We don't deserve to hear from you. All of us have sinned enough today and not loved you today enough to warrant eternity in hell. But you've been so kind and gracious to us. You've given us your son. You've given us your son to be our, our substitute, the, the one who stands in our place, the one who dies and is punished for the sins that we committed today and then gives us his very own righteousness so that we can come before you boldly asking you to speak to us. So Father, I want to ask just that. I want to, I want to pray that you be gracious to us and you would speak to us in your word and that you would change us in your word and that we'd be attentive to your word and that we would be people of your word. Pray that you would do these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So like I said, this is the last sermon in our series, The Fight of Faith. And if you've been here, we started this, um, I think in, in the summertime of this, this past year, kind of when we came back from the COVID uh, virus. And uh, we've covered everything from weariness to anxiety to anger and lust. We've covered uh, bitterness and laziness last week. We've covered envy, just these really practical problems that we all face in our own Christian life. Our goal has been to show how biblical truth applies to really practical problems in life. And then we've sought to take God's word in these teachings that we've had, and we've really sought to just kind of put legs on them is kind of the language we've used. How does this work on Thursday? Try to show like, how, how can we practically live out and fight the fight of faith in these areas of our lives? And, and I, I think it's all been very helpful. I, I know it's been really growing for me as I have been teaching in, in partnership with Pastor John and Pastor Andrew in this series. But there's something missing. There's something that we haven't talked about yet in this series. And if we don't talk about it, we're going to be in big trouble. If we don't talk about it, you are going to fail in your fight of faith if we don't talk about what we're going to talk about today. You, you will shrivel up, your faith will shrivel up, and you might even walk away from the faith entirely if you don't have this missing piece. So, so this is really serious stuff. So, so what is the thing that's missing that we haven't really focused in on that you have to have if you're going to fight the fight of faith? Here's the thing you need. Other Christians. 
That's what you need. It's the one thing we haven't really focused in on yet, that if you're going to fight the fight of faith, you must be in biblical relationships. You have to be in in loving and meaningful and open relationships with other Christians in the local church. And that is what Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 through 15 is all about. So in Hebrews chapter 3, the author of Hebrews is, is talking about receiving God's word with faith and not hardening your heart to God's word. So when you hear God's word, you should receive it with faith and don't harden your heart. And he gives these examples of Moses from Psalm 95 and, and, and the people of Israel and how they harden their heart to God's word. And in, in Hebrews chapter 3, he's, he's talking about fighting the fight of faith over the long haul and not getting discouraged in the trials of life. And right in the middle of that chapter, in verses 12 through 15, the author tells us that if we want to fight the fight of faith, we have to do it together. It's the main thing he says. If we're going to fight the fight of faith, we've got to do it together. But how? How do you do that? I mean, we, we talk about this stuff in church all the time. We talk about the church as a family, and, and we got, yep, you got to be in relationships, and yep, I need to be in a life group, and I need to be in a Sunday school class, and I got to have friendships, and I got to have relationships with other Christians. But, but how do our relationships in the local church actually help us fight the fight of faith? So if we're, we're going to say, I want to be like that. I want to have relationships like that that help me and my faith, and I want to be a friend and have relationships with other people that help them as they fight the fight of faith, how do we do it? So I want to give us three ways that we fight the fight of faith together from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. So here are the ways. The first way we fight the fight of faith together is, number one, we watch. We watch. I don't know if you remember this. I'm sure you remember this. The first days of quarantine in 2020, when everything got shut down. You, you know, everybody had their different moment when they realized that COVID was going to be an impact on your life. For a lot of people, it was when Tom Hanks got COVID. Everybody thought, oh my goodness, this is real. Uh, for some people, it was when they like looked and Walmart was closed or they got to the drive through at McDonald's or they got to Chick-fil-A and it wasn't Sunday, but it was closed. And Everybody had their moments when quarantine started getting really real. We all just shuttered up life. We stayed inside. We, we didn't see our friends or many members of our family for weeks. And we all started asking the same types of questions. I don't know if you noticed this. So instead of conversations starting with, hey, how was your weekend? Or, or how was that thing that you just did? We all started our conversations with the same things. It was, how are you feeling? How's your health? Are you okay? Are you doing okay? Are you, have you been sick? Why are you sniffling? And we still do this. I've actually noticed this today. More people ask me about my health, and I like to think I'm a spry 30-year-old man, and, but there's so many people talking to me about my health these days and probably talking to you more frequently about your health as well. That's called being watchful. That's what that's called. Sometimes it's called paranoia but that's another conversation. But it's called, in its best forms, being watchful. We're, we're taking care of each other. We're, we're considering, how are you doing? How's your health? Are, are you okay? I'm, I'm watching your health, and you're watching my health. And that is what the author of Hebrews says that our relationships should be like in verse 12. Look at verse 12 with me. He says, take care brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Take care here means be watchful of one another. Watch each other. Watch out for each other. It means be sensitive to the lives of other Christians. He, what he's envisioning is the entire church is taking care of the entire church. That's what he's envisioning. Did you notice? It, it's a community command. It's not a command to individuals. 
It's a command to an entire group, an entire community of people. Look at verse 12 again. He says, take care, brethren, or brothers, or brothers and sisters. He's talking to a group of people. He's saying, you take care, church. And then he wants them to take care. Look look at verse 12 again. He says, take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you, which is the church again. He's saying, I want the whole church to take care of any one of you in the church, the whole church together. But what are we taking care and watching for? Look at verse 12 again. He says, take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart. That's the fight of faith. You see that? He's saying, take care that you keep believing. And it's really deadly serious. Look at verse 12 again. Let's just keep going through. Take care that there not be an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. So we're not asking, how's your health? We're asking, how's your soul? That's what we're asking. How are you doing spiritually? We're seeking to guard each other from unbelief in our lives. Why? Because the end of unbelief is destruction. If we continue on, if we turn away from the Lord and we live a life of unbelief, we will prove that we never knew the Lord to begin with. And it ends in destruction. We should always be watchful of one another in the local church. So if you join a church, if you become a member of our church, or if you are a member of our church, you have made a promise and you've made a commitment to watch the lives of other believers and to let those believers watch your life too. Now, we we should always be watchful, but I I believe there are really particular times that your, your, your ears should perk up in the life of another believer. When you're talking to another Christian in this church and you hear them talk about certain types of things or in certain types of categories, you're like Christian local church spidey senses should be going off and you should be thinking, I need to really watch and I need to really encourage and I need to really love. Let me, I just want to mention three categories of, these are things that you're going to, every Sunday you're going to hear these categories in people's lives. And when you hear these categories, you should be thinking, I got to move in. I got to love that person. I got to watch and love and encourage and take care. So let me just mention three of them. When people are suffering, during suffering, we need to be really watchful. 1 Peter 5 8, be sober minded, be on alert, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. This passage is often a passage we use to talk about how the devil's a lion and he's really scary and he's really intense and he hates Christians. That's true, but we got to remember in the context of 1 Peter 5, it's a passage about suffering. That's what this passage is about. What Peter is saying is that when we suffer, Satan roars at us. He roars at us, and he tries to destroy the faith of Christians. And you know that to be true in your life when you suffer, don't you? When you suffer, you just start thinking like, God, what in the world is going on? Are you really good? You start reading your Bible, and you're like, I see that that's what the Bible says, but that's not my life. My life is the complete opposite of that. The devil roars at us and he seeks to destroy our faith. When we see brothers and sisters in our church going through a season of suffering, whether it's physical suffering, they've got big surgery coming up, they're in a lot of pain, they're really struggling, whether it's um, uh, they've been sinned against really grievously, maybe they've lost a job, whatever, we should perk up and we should move in and we should be watchful and surround them during those seasons of intense suffering. So that's the first area we ought to be watchful. Second area we need to be watchful is what I would say dur- during worldly immersion. Worldly immersion. Let me explain what I mean by that. But first let me read 1 John 5.19. 1 John 5.19 says, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So this whole world, this whole fallen world we live in, 
lies in the power of the evil one. I don't even have to prove that to you culturally. We just know that's true, right? The whole world is, is, is following after Satan. And what that means for Christians is not that we leave the world, not that we go and we just kind of lock all the doors to this church and say, we're just going to be in together and we're just going to have a really good thing happening in here. No, the, the call is that we are just to, meet, to be awake in the world, We need to know that there's a real enemy and that the world is not following after the Lord. And what that means is that we need to care about the members of our church when we know that they're spending the majority of their time in a hostile, unbelieving world. I'll give you an example of what this means. Maybe you're in your Sunday school class and someone says, man, I just want to ask for prayer because I spend all of my time working with people that are unbelievers. And they're not just unbelievers, they're like really hostile to the faith. Or maybe someone raises their hand and they're like, I'm, I'm married to someone who's not a Christian. And I, I'm really, really struggling. Like I, I've trusted in Jesus, but m- my spouse hasn't. And I don't, I don't know what to do. And they're actually really hostile to my faith. They actually don't like that I'm here coming to church right now. When we hear that as believers, we know that your whole life is is, is immersed in the world. We need to move in. We need to be watchful over their faith and encourage them and love them. The The third time we need to really, really perk up as believers and be watchful is during repentance. During repentance. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, even if a person is caught in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual are to restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you are not tempted as well. So when someone is walking in sin in this local church and, and, and we, we notice that, it's our responsibility to lovingly and gently and humbly go and, and, and talk to that person and, and ask them, to to turn away from that sin and to forsake that sin. And there will be times in this local church where where someone is turning out of sin that they've been walking in for a very, very long time. And they're trying to learn how to walk in obedience to Jesus Christ in a new way. And it's our job as believers to walk right alongside those people, to not pull back from those people, to not pull back from people that are struggling to repent out of sin, but instead we need to move in with the spirit of gentleness. And we need to be watchful, and we need to take care of them, and we need to love them. That's what it means to be fighting the fight of faith together. We gotta be watchful of each other. And, and, uh, And one just really practical application of this for us that I would love to see us growing in as a church together, and as if you're just thinking about applying this to your life, is I would love for us to become better question askers and better listeners at our church. I would love us to be people who ask each other really good questions and listen to each other before we speak to each other. We're going to speak to each other. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But I would love for us to be people that ask the right types of questions, asking each other questions when we're together, like, hey, I know we're all about to leave, but before, before I go, how can I pray for you? Is there anything particular that I can pray for? Or, hey, I'm curious. We're all growing in various ways and struggling in various ways in our Christian life. Are there any ways that you're struggling right now in your walk with Christ that I can just be praying for you about or that I could help with or... I'd love to share with you ways that I'm growing too right now, asking those types of questions. Or, hey, how are things going in your relationships right now? How are things going in your marriage? How are things going in your parenting? How are things going at work? Could you just share with me how those things are going? I want to walk with you in your life. I want to help you grow spiritually. We ask people those questions, and then we listen. We keep our mouth closed, and we listen for faith. How are they responding to their life? Are they responding in faith or are they responding in unbelief? Why do we care about that? Why do we care about seeing whether or not someone is walking in unbelief or whether they're walking in faith? Because it's our goal in our relationships to encourage one another. That's our goal. We want to encourage other believers, which leads to the second way that we are meant to fight the fight of faith together. So we watch, and then number two, we encourage. We encourage. So I was, um, I was pranked 
recently. And some of you, I don't know how many people have seen the video of me being pranked, but there's a large number, and it's spreading like wildfire um, because I was pranked recently by someone who used to work here. No, I'm just kidding. They still work here. Um, A... (laughs) Now everybody's going to want to see this video. Uh, A fake snake was put in my office. I, I, I don't think I could overstate for you how much I hate snakes. Like, like I, don't, I don't think it's possible. Like, I deeply hate them. And uh, they frighten me, <laughs> too. And uh, I opened the door of my office, and it was dark, and as I opened it, a snake started slithering towards my door. And it totally got me. Like, I mean, it was bad. Like, I screamed out loud, shut my door, and ran to another office across the room and was, like, hyperventilating. And, and I, I continued to scream in my office. And um, it totally got me. I was horrified. Horrified. Someone had to come over to me and convince me that a snake wasn't in my office. Why did I respond that way? Why did I totally freak out when I saw what was a rubber snake attached to a hanger with a string attached to it, wrapped around the doorknob of my door, around the chairs in my office, so that it would literally slithered wickedly towards me? Ugh! It was Andrew Cunningham that did it, just so you know. (laughs) And... Why did I respond that way? It was fake. It's a rubber snake. It's not real. Why are you freaking out about this? It's because I was deceived, right? That's what happened. I believed something untrue, and it controlled my actions. In this situation, I I had to have... Andrew Cunningham come up to me and tell me, it's a rubber snake. I got it off Amazon. It's not real. He had to come up and convince me that it wasn't true. Deception is really powerful, isn't it? It's really powerful when you can deceive somebody. And the author of Hebrews says that that is the reason we have to fight the fight of faith together. We have to fight the fight of faith together because we can be so easily deceived. Look at verse 13. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin lies to us. That's why it can be so powerful in our life. It lies to us. It over-promises and under-delivers. When we sin, we have believed a lie about God, about ourselves, about the world. If we want to avoid sin in our life, God's word has to expose the lies of sin. We've all done this before when we sin, right? We, we partake in a sin that has always led to guilt and shame and destruction, but then we do it again and we get on the other side of it and we're like, why did I do that? And the answer is that we were deceived. Sin lied to us. And we need God's word to expose the lie of sin so that way we don't get hardened by it. If we don't expose the deceitfulness of sin, this passage teaches that we could be hardened by it. We start to really believe the lie. Have you ever met someone that's believed the lie and you can't convince them that it's not true? And it takes a miracle to open their eyes. Maybe that's you. Maybe that was you. And it took a miracle of God to show you that sin had been lying to you that the snake was fake. It wasn't real. So how do you fight deception in your life? Sin is going to deceive you. You you are going to be lied to 
You're going to be lied to when you walk out of here. You're going to be lied to again before you go to bed tonight. Sin is going to lie to you. It will lie to you over and over and over again. So how in the world are we going to fight in a world full of lies? Verse 13 again. We encourage each other day after day as long as it is called today. Throughout Hebrews 3, the author is quoting Psalm 95. And in, in that psalm, God is calling his people to believe God when they hear his voice. The psalmist is reflecting on the story of Moses making water flow out of the rock when the people in the area of Meribah are grumbling against the Lord and it says they're testing the Lord and they're being suspicious of the Lord and whether or not he would provide for them. And the author of Hebrews is reflecting on that psalm and he's saying, don't be like them. Don't harden your heart. If you hear God's voice, respond to it. How do you not have a hard heart? Like it's talked about in Psalm 95, as the author's talking about here in Hebrews. How do you not get a hard heart? Day after day, the author says, we should encourage each other with the truth of who God is as he's revealed himself in scripture. That's what we got to do. We've got to take the truth about who God is and speak it to each other to expose the lies of sin. That's called encouragement. That's what encouragement is in the Bible. Encouragement in the Bible is not like giving someone a jovial punch on the shoulder and saying, hey man, it's going to be okay. It's all good. That's not encouragement in the Bible. Encouragement in, in the Bible is appealing to each other with the truth of Scripture. It's comforting each other with the truth of God's character. It's really specific. It's I'm trying to build up your faith. I'm saying, believe it, believe it, believe it. I want you to believe this. Let me put this in front of you for you to believe. We've got to be people at the Nocatee campus who speak and appeal with the truth of God's word in specific situations. We listen well, like we talked about. We ask good questions and then we take the word of God and speak it into one another's life. Listen to Ephesians 4.29. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. But if there is any good word for edification according to the need of the moment, say that so that it will give grace to those who hear. So make a resolve I'm only going to say, I'm only going to open my mouth in the life of another Christian when I've got something to say that fits this moment and will give them grace and build them up. Build what up? Their faith. We're helping them fight the fight of faith. That's called encouragement. We want to give grace to each other. Are we using our words in this way in our relationships? Are we building each other up? Send text messages to each other like that. Make phone calls just for that reason. Meet up with each other. Have dinner. Study the Bible. Find ways to listen and to speak to one another because we're committed to encourage each other. And we're supposed to encourage each other day after day, after day, after day, after day, until we've been doing that together for 30, 40, 50 years, until we're laying on our deathbed and we have that same friend or group of friends that is still speaking the truth into your ear as you're taking your last breath. That's the fight of faith together. Day after day until we reach the finish line. And that leads to the final way we fight the fight of faith together. We watch, we encourage, the number three, we hold fast. We hold fast. Look at verses 14 and 15. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance, firm until the end, while it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. The reason we fight together is because we must Hold fast to Jesus Christ. If someone walks away from Jesus Christ, 
you've known somebody that you grew up with and they professed to know Jesus Christ and then they walked away and they kept on their unbelief right up until the end and they died in their unbelief. The Bible teaches that they never knew Jesus to begin with because the people that truly know Jesus endure until the end. That's is what 1 John chapter 2, verse 19 teaches. John writes, They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. So you see it? If they would have really been with us, they would have kept going till the end because that's who Christians are. They keep going till the end. But they went out so that it would be evident that they are not of us. So if someone doesn't know, if someone walks away from Jesus Christ, they're proving that they never really knew him to begin with in a saving way. But those who truly know Jesus Christ, what verse 14 calls partakers of Christ, partners with Christ, are those who hold fast to their original assurance. What does that mean? What does it mean to hold fast to your original assurance? It just means this, you keep believing what you believed at the beginning. That's what it means. Do you remember the moment you believed in Jesus for the very first time? Do you remember what you saw about your sin? Do you remember what you saw about the, the sufficiency of Jesus to forgive you? Do you remember that moment where it was all just gloriously clear and true and beautiful and everything you ever needed for every desire you've ever had in your life and Jesus became this treasure and how could you not trust him? Do you remember that moment? The author is saying, hold fast to that. Don't hold fast to that moment. Hold fast to that Jesus. Hold fast on to him. Keep believing what you believed day after day after day after day until it's done, all the way until the end. You keep believing God's word. That's why the author of Hebrews ends with this quote from Psalm 95. He's encouraging us not to harden our hearts. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Keep believing what you believed. Keep believing. Don't you see this? You, you see this. One of the key ways God is going to enable you to hold fast to your assurance and to not harden yourself to his word is through fighting with other Christians. This is what this passage is teaching. This is the way to have your assurance until the end. It's through other Christians encouraging you and strengthening you and building you up. This is why it's always so concerning and it's always red alert and it's always big bad signals to me when I watch Christians start to isolate themselves from other Christians. It's usually the first sign that something's going wrong. When they back away from relationships, when you reach out to them and say, hey, I just want to re get together and just talk through what's going on in your life and they say, you know what, I'm just really busy right now. I don't really want to talk. That's always the first sign that something hardening is happening in their life. We watch each other. We encourage each other to hold on to Jesus Christ, to submit to his word, to obediently follow him, to be a recipient of his grace, to enjoy his grace and to enjoy the cross. This is, this is what I want for us. I want our campus, I want the people in this room, I want the people that are here on Sunday mornings, I want, what I want for us more than anything is for us to be a, have a culture of pursuit of one another. I want us to have a culture of pursuit. What that means is that we would be people that would say, I'm not gonna let go of you. You look Christians in the eye, they'd say, no, nah, I'm, I'm too far gone. And you'd say, I'm not going to let go of you. Or Christians who give you the stiff arm and say, leave me alone in my sin. And you say, I'm not going to let go of you. I'm going to pursue you. Even if you don't love me back. Even if you get mad at me for it. I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to love you. I want to speak the truth of God's word into your life. I'm going to hold 
fast. I want us together to hold fast to Jesus Christ. I want us to be people that when we see somebody starting to drift, start getting shoddy in their attendance, they're not saying the things they used to say, they're not as warm to you as you, they used to be, I don't want our response to be, well, I'm going to pull back. I don't, get, I don't got time for that. I don't get time for people that treat me like that. So fine, I'm just going to pull back. I don't want us to be people that pull back in judgment. I want us to be people who move in in pursuit and love for people. And we say to them, listen to Jesus' voice in his word. Listen to him. Don't harden your heart. Hold fast to him. Keep trusting in him. Draw near to him. And we get to be ambassadors of Christ in people's lives. When we draw near to them, we get to represent Jesus Christ to them when we hold his word before them. The world wants to kill your faith and it's got to be preserved. Satan wants to attack your faith and it needs to be protected. Your flesh, your sinful flesh will oppose your faith and it must withstand. How will all of those things happen? It's going to happen through other Christians, strengthening your faith, exposing your sin, building you up, encouraging you, and saying to you, I am not going to let you go. I want you to be those types of people. And I want to be that type of person. If you're a Christian, I, I want you to think for a moment about all the people in your Christian life that God has used to preserve your faith. Just think back for a moment on this. Think back on the people in your life that God has used to preserve you. So, so just think of them. Think of the person that you called when you were in the pit of anxiety and depression. Think about the person that called you out when you were ensnared in bitterness and in anger. Think about the person that walked with you as you were repenting out of that long-standing sexual sin. Think about the person that listened for a long time and was slow to speak as you shared your burdens of weariness with them. Think about the person that helped you think creatively about how you could share the gospel with that neighbor. Think about the person that gave you wisdom and that really confusing decision that you had to make. And you were like, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what I'm going to do. And you talked to them and they just provided the greatest biblical wisdom and clarity. Think about those people. Think of those faces. Think of them. Think of their names. Who were they? What did they do? What did they say? How did God use them in your life? Are you thinking about them? Do you recognize that those people were instruments in the hands of Jesus Christ to preserve you, to keep you close to him, to keep you fighting the fight of faith? Do you realize that they were just tools, instruments in the hands of Jesus Christ preserving you? That Jesus Christ himself was loving you through that person having that conversation with you. It was Jesus that was doing that through them. It was Jesus. Do you realize that one of the regular ways that you're going to experience God's love for you is in the gift of the local church? I have conversations with church members and they'll say, I just want to know that God loves me. I just, want to, I just want to see it. If God would just show me that he loved me and I want to look at them and I just want to say, look around. Look around at all these displays of God's love for you. Jesus Christ came into the world. He lived, he died, and he resurrected in order to save us from our sins. He's reconciled us to himself, but he's not reconciled us to himself so that we could be alone. He has saved us into a community of people. We're the household of God. He saves us into the local church, and he intends on his church to be a place where we fight the fight of faith together. Jesus died to create a brand new community that loves each other in that way. 
And that leads us to our renewing thought. Our final renewing thought is this. God calls us to be encouraged by and to encourage the faith of others. God calls us to be encouraged by and to encourage the faith of others. Jesus died and rose so that you would be in in the body of Christ, growing together and fighting together for faith in him. So let's fight the fight of faith together. We hope you enjoyed today's sermon. If you have questions about the message, reach out to us at askapastor at fbcjacks.com. We meet for services every Sunday morning and Wednesday evening. For more info, go to fbcjacks.com slash Thank you for watching. And we're praying for you as you go reaching all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life.